Praise the Lord. Good morning to everyone. Please follow me in the word of God, Psalms 115. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with string instruments and flute. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that hath breath do what this morning? Praise the Lord. Say it again. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And that's what we're going to do today. We give God thanks for who he is and we're going to tell him about how we can praise him because of all that he has done for us. Amen. Amen. Would you give God a round of applause? Give God a round of applause. A big round of applause. I can put on the mic because I want to do it too. Amen, amen, amen. The first one we're going to sing is a hymn that a lot of us should know. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed redeemer. Hallelujah. And we're going to sing that song today. Giving God all the praise. And remember the word says praise him with a symbol and dance too, you know. Use your hands and your symbols, your fingers, your ten strings to praise God. Amen.
praises him so why shouldn't we yeah? hallelujah thank you Jesus blessed be the name of the Lord didn't I tell you we can bless the Lord today blessed be the name of the Lord why the name of the Lord is a strong tower what else the name of the Lord is our hope hallelujah blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be the 
Hallelujah. The words, the word of God tells us so much of how we can bless his name. The psalm is full of it. Bless the Lord of my soul and all that is within me. Bless the Lord of my soul and forget not all his benefits. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places for his dominion. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Ah, oh Lord God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed in honest, honor sorry, and majesty. So bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. He deserves our glory. He deserves our praise. He deserves all the glory. So let's bless the Lord. Tell yourself, bless the Lord, oh my soul. When you feel downtrodden and downhearted, lift your spirit up by saying, bless the Lord, oh my soul, for all that he has done. Hallelujah. Bless his name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, worship Your holy name. Can we sing that again? Somebody might need to sing to do this. The Lord, oh, my soul. Oh 
bless the Lord. Sometimes you just have to tell yourself, bless the Lord. When you're spirited down, you gotta say, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Forget not all his goodness. Forget not all his benefits. He is our shield. He is our hope. He is our comfort. He is our peace. He is all in all. So bless. I say bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Can we just for one minute just bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Welcome to the online broadcast of the Calvary Temple Community Church. We now join Reverend Andre Simmons live for the sermon. The book of Philemon, How to Redeem a Rebel. If I had to put a theme on it, it would be making the used and the useless useful. Making the used and the useless useful. A little bit of backdrop. When Paul was in prison... He shared the gospel with a, a runaway slave named Onesimus. It's amazing. It is amazing what we can do from lockdown or lock up, depending on what side of the bars you're on. <laughs> it's amazing what we can do from lockdown. Paul, whilst in lockdown or lock up, reached this runaway slave with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Keep in mind that the Greek term for runaway slave meant renegade, rascal, rebel, any of those are words. Sometime after Onesimus had become a Christian and a friend of the apostles, Paul sent him back to his master. Paul sends him back to Philemon, asking that Philemon welcome him back as a brother in Christ. What a thing. From brute to brother. <laughs> it's a difficult transition to make. But it's made easy by true Christians who help those who are truly trying to make it back home. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This letter illustrates how the good news about Jesus Christ breaks down barriers, transforms relationships, and unites all true believers together in the family of God. And it reads thus, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord, if then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. 
But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. <laughs> But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers, I shall be granted to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Father, I ask for your help this morning, that in the next few moments, this word that is already anointed will be crystallized to our hearts. And the application thereof will be clear. I ask that every single person on the sound of my voice, watching here in person and watching online at another time, will receive something from God Almighty to the effect that their lives will be transformed and that they will become that much more like your son Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I ask that today. I need your help. Touch this frail vessel and anoint me today, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. The name Paul means small. Or humble. Everybody say Paul. The name Philemon, to whom the letter was written, means loving, affectionate. Everybody say Philemon. And if you listen to the word carefully, you can connect it with the Greek word phileo, which means love. Phileo, Philemon, city of Philadelphia. You hear the fills in there? It means loving and affectionate. The name Onesimus, about whom the letter was written, means useful or profitable. Useful or profitable. Everybody say Onesimus. I want us to see, if nothing else, just on the surface, before we even dig down into this beautiful, beautiful letter. I want us to see with God's help how our small, humble, loving, affectionate, you, you, hear the, you hear the adjectives? Small, humble, loving, affectionate deeds can be useful and profitable. If nothing else, I want us to see that. That the Paul and the Philemon type deeds can be Onesimus, useful, profitable. As we seek to navigate this Christian walk to which we have been called. Keep in mind, I tell you the title redeeming rebels how to redeem a rebel <laughs> keep in mind that we're all rebels <laughs> we are all runners and runaway servants <laughs> we are renegades you say pastor speak for yourself <laughs> my bible tells me all be like sheep not some all isaiah the prophet said, all we like sheep have gone, I can't hear you, astray. Oh, oh, mummies have gone. Daddies have gone. Husbands and wives have gone. Children, brothers and sisters, ministers of the gospel, fellow laborers in departments have gone astray. 
We've run. We know how to run. We run well. Romans 6.23 tells us none are righteous. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know how to run. I say we run well. We do. Not to God, but from God. We run from his call. We run from his conviction. We run from his conversion. We run well. I speak on behalf of all of us now, having gotten your attention. We run. We run from God's touch. We run from God's truth. Yes, we do. We run. We run from God's will. And we run. God, have we run from your word. We have all run. We run well. We know how to run. It's tough to run to God, but it's easy to run from him. We are runners, rebels, renegades, rascals. But thank God today. Oh, if I had two people, I could celebrate with me alone and them. Ah, but God, he didn't leave us that way. If he didn't leave you that way, I want to hear your voice today. He didn't leave us that way. We started that way, but you don't have to finish that way. Three points and I'm through. A humble admonition. A humble admonition. A loving appeal. A loving appeal. And lastly, some useful application. Some useful application. Humble, loving, useful. First of all, verse 6 to 7, a humble admonition. Admonition. One translation couches verse 6 this way. I pray that the sharing of your faith may promote the knowledge of all the good that is ours in Christ. That's a fair translation. The RSV puts it that way. I pray that the sharing of your faith, Paul writing to Philemon, may promote the knowledge of all the good that is ours in Christ. The phrase translated the sharing or communication, depending on your translation, of your faith has posed challenges for scholars down through the years. Obviously, Christian generosity was a characteristic of this slave master called Philemon. He was generous, to say the least. He had love for God's people, both by name, Philemon, and by nature, when you get an understanding of who this man was. Very generous. Very generous he was. His home offered travelers rest and refreshment. And now Paul, the humble, is going to humbly ask the generous man to be even more generous yet. Interesting that. Be even more generous. They tell us that if you need something done, uh, don't look for someone who has time on their hands. Don't, 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 don't give them the task. Find somebody who is very busy. They'll get it done first. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Don't look for folk who always got oodles and oodles. They have nothing to do. They have all day to do it. Never in a hurry. Them. Good Friday could come on Wednesday. It doesn't matter. I got time. Don't give them the task to do. It will never get done. Give it to a busy person. Because they understand time management. And they will get it done. Even though they're busy. Even though they're busy. This man, Paul, is asking this man, Philemon, who is already generous, to be even more generous. Application is great here. It means that we learn about Christ by giving to others. Number one, we learn about Christ by giving to others. Secondly, it means that by emptying ourselves in Christ, we ourselves are filled with Christ, by emptying, by emptying, <laughs> interesting pastor, by emptying ourselves in Christ, we ourselves are filled up with Christ. God has a way of doing things that 
in the natural just don't make sense. The earthly wisdom that we were cautioned about two Sundays ago should come to your remembrance right about now. God's methodologies always seem so weird compared to our natural understanding of how things ought to go. Thirdly, it means that to be open-handed and generous-hearted is the surest way to learn more and more about the wealth of Christ. To be open-handed and generous-hearted is the surest way to learn even more about Christ. The man who knows most of Christ is not the intellectual or the scholarly. Not even the saint who spends all their days and weeks in solitude and prayer. But the man or woman who interacts lovingly and generously amongst his fellow men. That is the man or the woman who will know more and more about Christ. Interesting. Interesting. Secondly, a loving appeal. Verse 8 through to 17. 8 through to 17. I'm just going to highlight some of the verses that are specific and that I, I want to, to draw references from for our application. Basically, in verse 8, Paul is saying, I could well be bold in Christ to give you orders. Look at verse 8 again. I, 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 he's saying, I could basically, I could tell you this is, this, this is what's happening. And I expect you to sort it out. I could be bold in Christ. Based on who I am, my credentials, my experience. The fact that you are my son in Christ too because you came to Jesus through my ministry. I could sit you down. Tell you this is what I expect of you, and if you don't do it, I will give you a whooping, take my belt off, and hide you. <laughs> I could do that. That's what Paul is saying. Huh? I could be hard nosed with you, but I ain't doing that. I ain't doing that. He says, I could well be bold in Christ to give you orders as to where your duty lies, but for love's sake, oh my gospel. Somebody should be getting something out of this message already. And we haven't even really gotten down beneath the surface yet. For love's sake, I will do what? Request it of you. I will request it of you. Give you the opportunity to say, man, I know that's a good idea. Yeah, I think I can do that. This one time I go, turn you down, Paul. I love you. But I got to turn you down on this one, boy. That brute, you want me to accept him back after he run away? You got to be making sport, man. I love you, Paul, but him? Nah, I hate him. <laughs> Paul could have given this man the straight order to do ABC, XYZ and have it done by end of play. But he said, no. I'll let you... I'll let you arbitrate. I'll let you arbitrate knowing that the love of God has constrained you to this purpose. Paul being Paul could therefore have demanded what he wished from Philemon, but he will only humbly request it. Someone said a gift must be given freely and with goodwill. If it is coerced, it is no gift at all. If it is forced, it is it's no gift at all. In verse 9, Paul refers to himself as old. Those of you who appreciate good Bible study will find this interesting. The rest of you will sleep. Paul refers to himself as old, O-L-D. Better translations will render the word ambassador. Ambassador, A-M-B-A-S-S-A-D-O-R. Not old, but ambassador. In the English, two completely different words that don't even have anything to do with each other because there are a lot of young ambassadors, and you can think of a few right now even from Barbados. Okay? And a lot of old folk who are not ambassadors and will never be ambassadors. Okay? But in the Greek, 
Watch this. There are two very similar words differing only by one single letter. The word presbutes, P-R-E-S-B-U-T-E-S, -E presbutes means old, old. And then presbutes, P-R-E-S-B-E-U-T-E-S, P-R-E-S-B-E-U-T-E-S. Presbutes means ambassador. What a thing. Two completely different words going to us in two different directions. But the Greek understood that one letter separated these two concepts or ideologies, these two words. So better translations will render the word ambassador and not necessarily old. Keep in mind also at the time of writing, Apostle Paul couldn't have been more than 55 to 59 years of age. Now, I don't know, but just by a show of hands, how many of you here are in your 50s? Just wave at me. You're in your 50s. Okay, keep, keep, keep the hands up. Keep the hands up. You're in your 50s. Come on, be proud about it. I mean, I, I lift my feet and all, except that I'm standing up. I'm like, I mean, I look, I know I look as in my 30s. Some of you are looking at me real strange now because you say, but pastor, I thought you were in your 30s. I know I look that way. But uh, <laughs> reality check. <laughs> so you can take your hands down. Now, the rest of you who didn't raise your hand just now, if you are honest, now you have to be honest. Somebody say be honest. You're in church. You cannot look at any of us who raised our hands a moment ago and look at us in the eye and honestly tell us that we are old people. Hello? Okay, so the verdict is in. All those in their 50s are still young people. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. <laughs> okay, so Apostle Paul could not have been more than 55 to 59, somewhere in that, that ballpark. Now, that doesn't mean to say that if you're 60, you're old. I just thought I'd put that out there. <laughs> Ooh, I just had to put that down. That was a footnote, boy, a disclaimer. <laughs> All right? But certainly, he was a seasoned senior servant of the Lord. In verse 10, finds Paul making his loving appeal for Onesimus. He does not make any excuses for the runaway servant. Watch this. He didn't make any excuses for him. He freely admits that the rebel and the runaway renegade was a useless character. Not my words, Paul's words. He freely admits that this runaway fella, this rebel, was a useless character. Playing on the word, of course, Onesimus, which means useful. And he makes this one claim, which you and I need to pay attention to. He makes this one claim. He says he was useful. He was useless, but now he is useful. I want us to see today that there is a time and a season when each of us, it could be said of us that we were useless, that we were indifferent, that we were no good that we were scoundrels, that we were rascals, that we were rebels, that we were, and you can fill in the blanks. But there's another season that comes when you meet the master. There is another day that comes when you meet the savior. And when that day comes and you by faith accept what Jesus did for you, you move from a past tense into a present tense. You move from being the rascal and the rebel to being the royal and the redeemed. You move from being a backslider to being a front runner. 
Am I talking to anybody? Is anybody getting anything from this message today? There comes a time when you meet the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You move from doing things that you used to do and you start doing things that you never thought you'd ever do. You stop all of the stuff that would have caused you to go down to a hot hell and you start doing all the things that will cause you to sit up in a holy heaven that you don't even have any right to but God said it's for you just because you came through the blood I've come to talk to somebody today some have come through the water some have come through the fire but all have come through the blood if that's you today it's a good time for you to jump up on your feet and shout out God you did it for me I used to be a nobody I used to be a but God you turned me around and you called me to be a saint hallelujah I was messed up somebody tried to mess me up but God did just then you picked me up the devil tried to shut me down but God you brought me around David said I was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord. There's something about when you make that switch, when you make that turn, when you turn the corner, when you round the bend. Thank God that though there are bends in the road, I'm happy to tell somebody today, the bend in the road is not the end of the road. Somebody would you get your praise on. Give God 10 more seconds of Holy Ghost praise. This is the King of glory who redeemed you, brought you out of a mile clay set you on your way and tell me that I ought not to praise my Jesus the devil is a liar and the father of lies he who sought me he who bought me can I not also praise him can I not also bless the Lord oh my soul and ah, oh, let all of my lips give him praise today Come on, we sang it a few moments ago. Somebody shout, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Man, it's a good time to give him praise this morning. You're in church, and this is a good place for you to declare, look what the Lord has done. Look what he has done. He brought me out. Just because you were caught up in adultery, fornication, Drunkenness, thiefing, lying, homosexuality, on and on and on and on. I know sometimes we like to call all the big sins as if sin had size. <laughs> the brand name sins. <laughs> but I want somebody to know today, if you were never guilty of any of those things that I just called, which would not be the truth. Because if you tell me you've never told a lie, you just told a lie. <laughs> if you were never guilty, not once, of any of them things, there is still this reality that stands on your doorstep. And you got to wake up to it every morning. You are still born a sinner. You're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because... You're a sinner. Do you get that? There's a difference. There's a difference. You sin because you've been born and molded and shaped in iniquity. You're a sinner, so you're going to sin. That's how it is. It's not a case where I can choose. To, man, I wake up today and see me down with that sin thing, boy. I will never sin again. Never ever sin again. Nope. Nope. Never. Never, never. <laughs> Bible says, he who says he is without sin, the same is a liar. You have been deceived. So God is able to take us from a past, a lifestyle that was debauched. However, it was debauched. It was debauched. And he's able to turn us around. I was going one way. And he picked me up and turned me around. That's repentance. 
where you stop going one way and you start going a different direction. You were running from God. Now you're running back to God. Remember I told you we're good at running. We're renegades by nature, rebels, rascals, selfish by nature. We need a Paul to come on our behalf and interact with a Philemon speaking, speaking metaphorically for every single last one of us who is an Onesimus. Are you with me today? It was James Denny who said, Christianity is the power with which we make bad men good. I love that. I love that. Christianity is the power with which we make bad men good. Mm. It is significant to note that Paul claims that in Christ, the useless person has been made useful. <laughs> the last thing Christianity is designed to produce is vague, incompetent, unproductive people. The last thing Christianity is designed to produce is vague, incompetent, unproductive people. Paul says, this man, he was a useless, good-for-nothing brute. Well, that's not what he said, but that's the Bajan virgin. <laughs> okay, that's the, that's the BIV, Bajan international virgin. However, I'm sending him back to you because though he was useless and all of them things, now he is useful, not just as a slave, but as a brother in the Lord. He left one way, and I'm sending him back another way. That's the gospel message. This is how you redeem a rebel. Christianity produces people who are of use. Who can do a job and do it better than they ever could if they did not know Christ. That's what Christianity can do. That's what the anointing of God that comes on a person and takes that talent and turns it into a gift. And that person gives that back to God and God multiplies it and puts it back into their hands and boom! Something beautiful takes place. Small wonder Jesus said on that day, it shall be said of slothful servants. Gusso, depart from me. <laughs> That's the B.I.V. Gusso. <laughs> True Christianity makes a man heavenly minded and useful on the earth at one and the same time. Paul refers to Onesimus as the child whom he has begotten in his chains. The child whom he has begotten in his chains. Now, now this is interesting. I'm getting ready to go a little bit deeper. Stay with me. I want to read that again. Because I'm getting ready to go to another depth. And I don't want to leave a single person behind. Stay with me. One commentator, a rabbi, a rabbi, puts it this way. If one teaches the son of his neighbor... The law, if you teach the word of God then to the son of your neighbor, the scripture reckons this the same as though he had given birth to that son. Ha! Huh. To lead a man to Jesus Christ is therefore as great a thing as to bring him into the world. Are you with me? I hope I'm not losing you. Are you with me? Somebody just wave at me if you're with me. It's one thing for me to, I can, I can, I can, I can well, not me, but ha, hallelujah. A mother and a father, a father and a mother, it takes two. A father and a mother, can, they can bring a fella into this world. But it takes someone who is wise enough, patient enough to win a soul for Christ. In that moment, you bring a fellow into this word. Uh, one is the world, the other is the word. Both are important. Both are important. I want to go deeper. 
I want to go deeper. Paul uses a term in the Greek that literally means from the same womb. Now, I got to tell you, I must confess, when I first heard this, several years ago I discovered this, it blew me away. As I tell you all something, it knocked my socks off and put them back on again without taking off my shoes. I couldn't believe it. From the same womb, ha, it would appear that in this loving appeal being made to Philemon, whose very name endeared the idea of love and affection, the apostle is not just playing on words, but he is bringing into focus the truth that both Philemon and Onesimus were his sons in Christ. Both of them came out of his spiritual womb. Oh my God, my God. He uses a Greek term that Philemon could pick up on, suggesting to him indirectly and subtly, softly, which is the tone of the latter, that both you and this runaway renegade that I'm sure you want nothing more to do with now, both of you have come from the same womb, mine, like a father and a mother. He's speaking to the slave owner and he's beseeching for the brother, Onesimus. My God, this is writing, folks. This is writing at its best. <laughs> My gospel, man. Both of them. In Christ are of the same womb, yoked together, inseparable and inextricably bound, with way more in common. Oh, come on, somebody. With way more in common than they have apart. Get ready. <laughs> oh, if the church knew, if the church of Jesus Christ knew, hear this preacher today, that she had more in common with each other, <laughs> then she had different from each other. She would put aside her differences and she would put aside her indifferences with each other. If she knew, but she don't know, she don't know. If she knew that she had more in common with each other and that the people in the pew had more in common with one another than they have apart from each other. That each assembly filled in this country, and they got more churches in Barbados to tell us than any other country in the world. I can't believe that, but it might be so. Per capita. Obviously, you got to do it per capita. <laughs> if the churches, the assemblies knew, that they had more in common with each other than they had apart from one another. They would put aside their differences, deal with their indifferences, and get on with the master's business. Oh, if the church knew. But she ain't know. She ain't know nothing. She ain't know. If she knew, oh, oh. I tell somebody today, if she knew, she would wake up, she would get up, she would dress up, she would look up, she would pray up, she would pay up, she would speak up, and she would live up, because just now, she's getting ready to go up. Oh, if she knew, oh, oh. But she ain't know. Lottie don't know. Lottie don't know. Lottie don't know. If the church knew what I know, she would behave differently with each other. But the devil is so conniving. He makes you to think that you have more apart than you have in common. So don't get along with each other. Stay at odds with one another. 
if the church knew what I have discovered. So the apostle says, you too, Philemon and you, that Onesimus who ill-treated you are of the same spiritual womb, the womb of Christ's gospel. The womb is the spiritual incubator of the gospel of Jesus. We are Christ and God reconciles us who were once reprobates, who were once rascals, who were once runaway renegades, who were once rebels. But belief in God's gospel and the intubation that is taking place through the finished, accomplished work of Calvary's cross and Gethsemane's empty tomb has reconciled us and redeemed us. If you believe that to be your truth today, can you lift up one hand, in fact, lift up two hands and give God praise today. If you know that Christ has redeemed you, if you're unsure, keep your hands down. Never force a fellow to do nothing yet. <laughs> mm, John 3.3, 3, Romans 1.16, Romans 5.8. And I could go on a plethora of passages treat to the fact that Christ has reconciled us through the gospel of God. Then comes the loving appeal. Paul would have loved to have kept Onesimus at hand, but he sends him back to Philemon. For he will do nothing without the slave master's consent. He could, but he won't. He won't. I love this type of leadership, incidentally, in case you haven't noticed. Because <laughs> some of you haven't known me long enough. But I love this type of leadership style. Where I don't have to hard nose anybody. What I tell you today, because I is the bishop. Hello, door. And if you don't do it, the fire gonna come down upon you. Hello, door. <laughs> no, that should never be. Not. Mind you, I know there are pastors who function that way. And I really don't want to start on that. Because I think I know more who do that than who do this. <laughs> but I have discovered the error in trying to hard nose people. I have discovered the error. For it has happened to me, and I will not execute anyone with what I was executed with. Hello? And further to wit, I see in Paul this type of leadership. Further to wit, I see in my Savior Jesus Christ of Nazareth this type of leadership. Meek, mild. I leave the choice up to you. But you know that as I do that, that I could tell you, this is what I expect of you. Get it done. But I don't have to do that. I leave the choice up to you. That is leadership. That is leadership. But I digress. I digress. Christianity, this is a significant thing here. I want you to get this down. Christianity is not there to help a man escape his past and run away from it. It is there to enable him to face his past and rise above it. I love that. That's powerful. That's powerful. So Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon, even though he would love to have kept him close to hand as a helper, a right-hand man of sorts. For this is who Onesimus was to Paul in prison. He sends him back sacrificially to Philemon. <laughs> and this is a significant thing that Christianity is not there to help a man escape his past and run from it. It is there to enable him to face his past and rise above it, man. Rise above it, man. Rise above it. Onesimus had run away, you say. Well, then he must run back and face up to the consequences of what he did. Accept them and rise above them. Anybody getting anything from Calvary today? Accept them 
and rise above them. Christianity is never about running. It is always about redeeming. Redeeming. But Onesimus had not only run away, it becomes apparent that he had also stolen something. <laughs> oh, the plot thickens, Pastor. <laughs> he didn't just run away, which was sufficient for punishment. But apparently he had stolen perhaps money from his master. Question for you. Has anyone ever robbed you of anything? Think about that for a moment. A couple people now probably going through your mind. <laughs> Say, yeah, I can think about five thieves. <laughs> Has anyone ever robbed you of anything? Money? Respect? Dignity? Recognition, position, property, robbed you of your property. It's supposed to be yours, but they went and draw the boundary line the wrong way. So about at least five meters gone over at you, which is supposed to be mine. Look where to put the fence. And we get an offense because of the fence. Anyone ever robbed you of anything? Think on these things. Ministry, perhaps. Maybe like Philemon, you're right. And the other fella is dead wrong. Maybe you're being asked today by the Spirit of God to forgive. To let it go. And to cut your losses. Maybe. Maybe. Now, please understand that Onesimus comes back with a difference. He went away as a heathen slave. He comes back as a brother in Christ. Left a thief. Returned a treasure. Oh my God. <laughs> Left as a rebel. Returned as the redeemed. But you say, Pastor, it is going to be hard for Philemon to regard this runaway slave as a brother. You're right. You are perfectly right. It is going to be like eating nails. How do I accept him back? He is a runaway renegade who thief my money. How do you just let bygones be bygones? Explain me that, pastor. I don't have all the answers. But when I read my Bible, which is what we will be governed by and will be judged by. Verse 17 tells me exactly that. Paul is exactly requesting that. Exactly. You must receive him as you would receive me. Ouch. That is real hard. But that is real truth. Real truth. Here again is something very significant, beloved. The Christian must always welcome back the man who has made a mistake. Hello? Too often we regard the man who has taken the wrong turn with suspicion and show that we are never prepared to trust him again. We believe that God can forgive him. Oh yeah. He is God. Oh yeah. He can forgive him. He is Christ. Not me. <laughs> we find ourselves incapacitated. Too difficult to do it. It is said that the most encouraging thing about Jesus Christ is that he trusts us on the very field of our defeat. The very area where we messed up. God picks you up, cleans you up, puts you right back in position and trusts you enough to go and get it right, son. We believe that God can. We must also. When a man has made a mistake, or a woman for that matter, the way back can be very hard and God cannot readily forgive the man who in his self-righteousness or lack of sympathy makes it even harder. For the person to come back home. 
Those who expect mercy must express mercy. Somebody needs to write that down. Those who expect mercy must express mercy. Lastly, some useful application. Verse 18 to 25. I'll just lift one verse here. The opening verse is sufficient for me to lift the kernel that I want to leave with you for this final point. Some useful application. Text tells us, if he has done you any damage or owes you anything, put it down to my account. When last have you heard that? How often do you hear that in business? How often do you hear that in church? How often do you hear that at home? How often do you hear that kind of thing? If anybody owes you anything, if so-and-so and so-and-so owe you anything, put it on my account. You don't hear that language too often. Paul tells Philemon, put it on my account. I, Paul, and it's as if, and in the Greek, it's rich because it is as if he's signing his name to it. So it's not just flippant talk, loose talk. Anybody can talk. And then when it's time to pay, you can't find the fella. No, he's signing his name to it in the Greek. It's rich. It's potent. He says, I, Paul, write with my own hand. And the understanding for Philemon and others reading the letter in the Greek is that he has just put his fist on this letter. I will repay it. In other words, this could stand up in court. If I had to go to court, he will pay it. It is one thing, it is one of the laws, I should say, of life. That someone has to pay the price for sin. And we know that. God can and God does forgive. But apparently not even God can free a man from the consequences of what he has done. It is the glory of the Christian faith. That just as Jesus Christ shouldered the sins of all men everywhere, so there are those who in love are prepared to help pay for the consequences of the sins of those who were dear to them, who are dear, who are near to them. Christianity never entitled a man to default on his debts. No. Paul writes with his own hand, that he will take on the responsibility and he will repay all of the rebels' debts in full. You want to know how to redeem a rebel? Philemon tells you how to redeem a rebel. With this type of overwhelming love, this demonstration poured out in the presence of Onesimus and the letter put in Onesimus' hand and he sent back to Philemon and hand delivers the witty letter. How does Onesimus come back and not come back to make amends for his wrongdoing? One of the things that draws us closest to God is not the threat of judgment, but the love that he's shed abroad for us. It is his loving kindness that draws us. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? I'm getting ready to close. I'm closing. This entire letter is a beautiful picture of the relationship between God and the Father. Beautiful. Beautiful. God the Son, Jesus Christ, and the born again believer. All three appear. God the Father, God the Son, and the believer. Without once mentioning the redemptive work of Christ on the cross, the entire letter is replete with this picture. It radiates with redemption. It radiates redemption. See this as I close. Some of you perhaps already, especially if you've studied the book, you've already picked this up. Others of you have seen this for the first time. You need to get this. Philemon, the slave master, pictures God the Father. He pictures God the Father. Owner of it all. He is the master. Paul in his mediatory role, pictures Jesus Christ acting on the behalf of the sinner. On behalf of the sinner. 
and the runaway rebel paying our sin debt in full a payment that was made to the father incidentally which freed us from all of our sins and injustices towards God and Onesimus finally the runaway renegade he is me he is you he is us today pictures all men everywhere especially those who turn away from the error of their ways repent of their sins and turn back to the father through the redemptive mediatory role of Jesus Christ the son can you see the three in this picture Philemon Paul Onesimus the father the son the believer Philemon Paul Onesimus the Father God, Jesus Christ, the Son, the born-again believer. Can you see that? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. This is writing at its best. But more than just literature, it's the gospel. It's the gospel. Where each of us have been given a highway back to God. And I want to say back to each other. Any serious believer listening to this message cannot walk away from it without making conscious specific plans to make peace with their fellow man I don't see how you could wherever it is possible of course you can't make people do anything but wherever there's an open door and they have not shut that door in your face you have got to make every effort after coming away from a message like this to make amends and peace with fellow believers if the church knew what I know I want to pray for us if you would stand where you are everyone standing please thank you so much father I, I thank you Lord for this company today who have given up their time and attention to a book that is seldom talked about seldom ever read when last have we heard a message from Philemon yet this is saturated with nuances shades and shadows of the purest form of the gospel of Christ without preaching a simple reading of this letter is sufficient to make a sinner come home. To make a sinner come home. God, I've delivered what you've given me to deliver to these people today. I have dispensed my duties. I have not preached. You told me to teach the letter. I have taught from this letter today. And I ask God that the word will fall on the soil of men's hearts and it will cause them to look within their own minds and consciousness and desire to do what God would have them to do. Not a man, not a preacher, not a teacher or a pastor. But may they do what God now would tell them. Go thou and do. Make wrong things right. In the name of Jesus. You're here today and you have never asked Christ into your heart. I just want to very quickly pray with you and lead you in a sinner's prayer. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Don't leave it up. Just raise it and take it down. You say, Pastor Andre, I want you to remember me in that closing prayer. I want to make confession of my own sin to God. God bless you. Yes, two, three. You may take them down. How many others today is there a fourth hand? Is a pastor, this word was sufficient for me to want to come back to God. To turn back to God. Better than that, to run back to God. I want to run from my own ways and run back to God's ways. I've seen three hands already. Is there a fourth? Quickly, just raise it and take it down. I'll pray with you and for you. Come on, somebody. You have not yet raised that hand. If you would, while the band plays something softly there to give us a little bit of platform upon which to pray. If you would raise that hand, you've not done so yet, please do so now. Thank you so much. Okay, so we've got three. 
Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you would, all of us can pray this prayer. I want you to pray it. Those of you who raised your hand just now, pray it and mean it with everything inside of you. Pray like this. Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I come back to you, Lord God. Where I have been in far country, and I have gone down wrong pathways, I come back to God. On this day, I confess I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe, Lord God, you died for me. Lord Jesus, you shed your blood for me. It was liquid love, ran down Calvary's cross. From your veins, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. But you shed your blood for me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For shedding your blood for me. From this day onwards, I ask you, teach me your will and your way. Teach me your word. Help me to live it, love it, and learn it. Thank you for putting my name in your book of life. I believe that in that book are all the names of those who have confessed their sins to you. That includes me today, Lord. I confess all of my sins to you. In Jesus' wonderful name, thank you for saving me today. Amen. Our friends on YouTube, God bless you. Thank you for subscribing. If you have not done that, please subscribe to our Calvary Temple Community Church Barbados. Go on there on the link right there on that, on that channel and subscribe if you would. More power to you. Thank you all for journeying with us today. It's been a joy of mine this past hour to bring you the Word of God and to pray with you and believe God for greater things on your behalf. Those of you who would like to continue giving or maybe if you would like to commence giving to our online platform or online church, you will see the number at the bottom of your screen there or CIBC Savings Account Bank and you will see that number. I encourage you to jot it down and uh, use it as the Lord will lead you along. Thank you for every gift you give and I prophesy blessings over your life in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit of God. God bless you from CTCC. Bye-bye.